to whoever is listening. Today is the 23rd of June, 1984. I'm Ed Van Nistendahl, senior, and I'm speaking with Minerva Walton, my grandmother, who is going to be talking about her parents. And I'll prod as necessary. <laughs> well, to begin with, I am the youngest of three children. No, I'm not. I'm the middle one of three children. I have an older sister and a younger brother. I was born in Swedesboro. My sister was born in Swedesboro. My brother was born in Mullica Hill. Their names are? My sister's name is Edith, now Edith Conroy, and my brother's name is James Du Bois. Uh, I don't remember living in Swedesboro because we moved to Mullica Hill when I was I assume about two, I have no proof, but my I am two and a half years older than my brother, which would make me believe that I was at least two when we moved there. Maybe I was only a year, I don't know. Anyway, that's where my earliest recollections are. And the, my father had a butcher shop in Mullica Hill. It was a little country butcher shop, and he also had a uh, route that he went out on and I'm not sure how many days if he went every day he might have because he depended a lot on the farmers for his uh, livelihood he could reach them where they couldn't reach him because he had the, the horses and the, the wagon to go to them the, uh, the route that he did uh, that was delivering to private homes on yes the farms. farms the farms he didn't do any commercial deliveries no, there weren't any stores that handled meat like that except his store, you know. And then while he was on the road, my mother took care of the store and she handled sides of beef and things like that, just like a man. I can see her doing that too. Yes, much much to her problem in later years. And she blamed a lot of her health problems in later years on the fact that she did do the man's work. Maybe she reached the later years because she had done all that. Well, work. this is true. She was she worked hard all of her life, even before she was married. And then my father had his slaughterhouse. He slaughtered his own beef, and this was a a place that we were not allowed to go because they brought the the cattle in, and at any time they could get loose. And we, of course, we didn't understand this. The fact that there was a a cow or a pig or a bull down in the slaughterhouse only meant that it was an animal down there and we wanted to see it. In back of the slaughterhouse there was a big pool. I don't know how many feet deep it was, but this carried off the the, uh, the remains and the blood and uh, from the, the uh, cattle when they were killed. Um, my brother and I used to sneak away and go down and stand in the doorway. And I don't remember only from my mother telling me, but this one day my father looked up and we're standing there in all of our glory, all dressed up, and he is killing an animal, which was necessary because after all, that's how you get beef and pork and veal and all of this. And uh, he was had the hose in his hand and he turned the hose on both of us. And we went screaming back to the house to my mother. And from that day on, we were very leery how we approached the slaughterhouse. Now, as I said before, there was this pool in the back, and there were twin boys that lived across the street who were the age of my brother. And the two families were very friendly, so the boys were over. Their father had a, a restaurant across the street, and they didn't have a big place to play in. And of course, our place had a barnyard, and we had a wagon shed in the slaughterhouse and a nice house and uh, they were over and they were very inquisitive and one of them fell in this pool of horrible stuff in the backyard well of course there was a lot of screeching and screaming my father rescued him and after that we didn't have any problem with the twins getting in the in the around the slaughterhouse they um then my father went bankrupt and we moved from oh another thing i remember at the at the butcher, ha butcher shop, we had a big house, which is still there, and so is the butcher shop. They're now antique stores, and I have visited them and talked to the people who live there. And uh, the, the twins, one day when my brother was across the street playing with them, 
They threw a bottle, and just as he stuck his head, it was a broken neck of a bottle, just as he stuck his head out the door, the bottle caught him right in the bridge of the nose. And just, oh, just missed his eye by just a fraction. So he had to have the doctor and had to have stitches and uh, whatnot. And then shortly after that, my sister, who was six years older than I am, she was skating on this pond, which was in back of the house. And there was a fellow doing fancy figure eights on the ice. And she was belly flopping on the sled. And he skated back and his skate caught her just above the eye. So they brought her home. And of course there was a big to do and the doctor came and she got so much attention and this very handsome young man brought her home. So maybe it was the next winter. It could have been that same winter. I was sent to get my sister to come home to take her music lesson and I was told not to fool along the way. Well, there was a nice hill there and there was a boy that I knew and he had a sled. And he said, where are you going? And I said, I have to go get my sister. So he said, hop on. So I hopped on the sled and we started down the hill. And about halfway down, this old man stepped right out in front of us and we flipped him right over the top of us. I fell off the sled and the boy ended up with the sled in, into a telephone pole. So I got up, brushed myself off, and I knew I had done wrong. So I rushed down the hill and came to uh, meet my sister. And when I met her, she screamed, look, she's bleeding, she's bleeding. And what had happened, I had gotten my eye cut. So I thought, oh, this is great. I'll have the doctor. I'll be petted and treated and ice cream and all the good things. And wrong. And wrong. When I got home, I really got my tail warm. So they were the experiences with the ice and the eyes, and we all had our, our day with having cuts above the eyes. And then um, things didn't go too good, and my father went bankrupt. About when would that have been? Um, maybe I was in the second grade. Um, this would be? About 17, 16. Yeah, about 1916, I think it could have been because uh, we, we didn't leave Mullica Hill. We moved to a, another uh, house right across the street from the school, which I thought was great. All I had to do was go out the front door and across the street to school. And I don't remember too many interesting things to talk about, except that I do remember that while we lived in that house, I had the mumps. Um, I, I can't remember. Oh, and there was the first bathroom. We didn't have a bathroom in the in the house where we were before, and I thought this was great. And much to my disappointment, uh, we couldn't use it. It wasn't hooked up, so that that was kind of discouraging. But we lived there, and we lived there until um, peace was declared. I was in the fourth grade when November peace, 1918. 1918. I remember that distinctly. I remember my. Um, my school teacher, and she sang, she had a nice voice, and she sang, and we all sang, and uh, incidentally, she was the woman who came to the viewing. Uh, that's her, that's she her, was yeah. my teacher, Doris Williams. <coughs> Pardon me. And then we moved to Glassboro. In the meantime, my father had taken a job with the... Uh, um, no, oh, I can't think of what it was called in Paulsboro. It was a, it, it's probably one of the oil companies now, but I can't remember what it was called. And uh, they were they were bad times, and there were a couple boats had sunk. And I remember one time my father came home and he had, um, this boat had sunk and it had a lot of children's shoes, and they had drifted in, and. Uh, my father brought the shoes home, and my mother dried them out, and we wore them. We had we had to wear the shoes, and I can also remember that they were very stiff and, and hard. I would imagine. Yes, they weren't very comfortable. And then um, we moved to Glassboro, and my when would that have been? 
well, it was 1918. Uh, it was right after that because uh, I was still in fourth grade. So it probably was that winter. Uh, war, yeah, war was, uh, peace was declared 1918, November. So this probably was that winter because I was in, still in the fourth grade when we came to Glassboro. And uh, my father took a job with the American store. What was then the American store, what's now Super Saver, Acme Market. And in the capacity of a butcher. And then um, I was, I went to fourth grade and I was very timid and, and frightened because I'd come from a little country town and as far as I was concerned, Glassboro was a city. <laughs> and uh, I can well remember there was a boy sat across from me and my feet didn't even touch the floor on the desk. And, uh, but the teacher that I had in the fourth grade in Glassboro was also she lived in Mullica Hill, and her sister was also a school teacher. So I did have a little connecting link with the, you know, the teachers. Maybe yeah. So then um, we lived <coughs> in Glass in on Academy Street in Glassboro, and those were uh, oh kid days. I mean, we played all kinds of games, and and uh, there wasn't a lot. There were a lot of interesting things happened there, but I can't. Oh, my sister got married while we lived there. That was a big thing. And then my father's brother owned and lived on a farm in Sharptown, between Sharptown and Auburn. And he also had a, a nice home in town in Woodstown. And he decided that he wanted to live in the house in Woodstown and he wanted somebody to operate the farm. So he reached got in touch with my father and my father decided that he'd try farming. So we left Glassboro and we went to a farm and I was in seventh grade. Now I was now top dog because Glassboro schools were so far ahead of the country schools that when the teachers were absent for any reason down there they sent me to teach the classes. <laughs> it was a four-room school there were two two grades in each room, and uh, it was it was fun. Now, I had to walk three miles to school and walk home three miles, which was torture because in those three miles, there was a farm and they had a bull. And I was petrified of this bull, but also they had a very good looking son. And I was, I thought in love with this son who probably didn't even know I existed because he must have been 10 years older than I was. But just to walk by and see him loading hay or, or feeding the cows or feeding the chickens, that was the thrill of the day. So I was torn between love and the bull. So um, then there was another farm, a couple farms uh, not too far from us, and they used to take their milk in and they had uh, milk wagons. And they would drive their horse and their, and their milk wagon in, and it would into be where? into Sharp Town to Richmond's Ice Cream. Uh -huh. And uh, they would get a ride to school. And sometimes, if they felt real generous, they'd pick us up. Other time, we'd have to walk. And then uh, I can also remember that it was a big day in my life. I got on the scales there and I weighed 100 pounds. I couldn't wait to get home to tell my mother I weighed 100 pounds. <laughs> and let's see what else. The farm was, was interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed the farm in this way. I had to work very hard. It seems to me I, all I ever did was wash dishes. And I had a cousin who would come and and they would eat their dinner and she'd go sit on the porch and she was about four times my size. And she'd go sit out front and I had to stand on a stool but I had to do the dishes. And I had pet cats and I had pet ducks and pet chickens and we had um, all kinds of, of good times and I I had uh, christening parties. I christened my, my kittens who I didn't realize at the time didn't care anything about water and I uh, christened them in the horse trough. And we had um, we had quite a combination of hired help. That always fascinated me. We had a, 
a Polak, an Indian, and a Negro. And the three of them all had room in the half of the house that was segregated. So it was, they had their own stairway, and that's where they went to sleep. And they got, apparently got along, although I don't think they got along too well. And the Indian, he, he just appeared one time out of nowhere. We never knew where he came from. And his name was Felix. Doesn't he, sound like an Indian name. No, and he, we loved him. And he used to sit on the back porch and uh, with my brother and I in the evenings, and he would tell us all kinds of stories. And he was very soft-spoken, very gentle. And one day we got up and Felix was gone. Just the way he came, he left. We never knew. And um, then we, my father decided that farm life was not for him. He gave it up. And we were there just a year. And we came back. No, wait. Four, four. Might have been a little over a year. We came back to Glassboro. And my father went back with American Store. By this time, I was in eighth grade. Yeah, I was in eighth grade. And of course, once again, transferring schools where I was ahead before I was behind. So I was tutored in arithmetic. <coughs> I had a good teacher, and she took pity on me, and she tutored me in arithmetic. And so I passed. Everything was fine. And then I went into high school. Oh, we, my mother was great for uh, renovating. She liked to get older houses and tear them apart. And I've often said that it, I woke up every morning to my mother with a saw in one hand, a hammer in the other, and a bag of nails. She was going to remodel something, knock out a partition or nail something up. But we always had nice homes when they, you know, when they got done, they were pretty. But she had, And I particularly liked this house that we lived in, in Glasgow. And it was um, a big house. And then my sister had where was that house? on Main Street, South Main Street, as opposed to where we lived later. Mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, my sister had, uh, she lived in New York. No, wait, she had, no, she, no. She lived in Glassboro and she was pregnant and she had a little boy. And then, um, who was the little boy? Paul. Okay. Paul, Paul Harvey. Harvey. He was... Uh, Paul Harvey Jr. Excuse yeah, me. very... Um, I'm trying to think. He wasn't very old, and they moved to New York. We went to New York to see him, which was a big event in those days. What was the reason for them moving to New York? His business. He he worked for Procter & Gamble. I don't know if it... Are they still in... I mean, Procter & Gamble? Uh -huh. Sure. Well, he... He, he was with them when Crisco first came out okay. because uh, he gave demonstrations. And my mother used to imagine he eats, has to eat a spoonful of Crisco. Well, as everybody knows, Crisco is not bad to eat. You could eat it. I mean, I've, I've heard of it having to eat worse things. So uh, we went, went to New York to visit mother and father and, and uh, my brother. And uh, that was a big time. We went for a week, and I remember I bought a pair of shoes and a pocketbook. Even in those days, I still had, <laughs> had an affinity for pocketbooks. Some things shoes. never change. Never change. <laughs> then um, my sister got sick. She had tuberculosis. And we had the little one. And he was very fond of me. So... Oh, and in the meantime, to back up a little bit, in eighth grade, um, this boy sat behind me, and he tormented me terribly. And his name was Ed Walton. And he lived down the other end of Main Street, and they used to come to church. He and his mother and father lived. The church was across from where I lived. But the drugstore was next door to where he lived. So when my mother would send me to the drugstore, I'd go around the block so I wouldn't have to go past this house. 
because I didn't like it. And he'd come up the street with his mother and father to go to church, and my mother would say, oh, here comes Mr. and Mrs. Walton, and that nice little boy. And I'd go, no, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> so that went on into high school. And um, let's see, I, I went into high school when I was 12. And uh, I loved school. My mother never had any problem with me going to school. I, I was ready and cried if I couldn't go. Except for history. I didn't care for history, <laughs> right. So that was to come later, I guess, because I surely had enough of it in later years. That's for sure. So then, um, let's see, sophomore, I, I was active in school, but not, uh, I, I played the necessary games and things in, in school that I had to do, but I never went out for any teams or anything. We did have a hockey team. Uh, I think we had a basket, baseball team. I don't know, but I, I didn't go in for any of that. Um, I, I can't think. I, I was really more interested in uh, the school itself, and I, I enjoyed being in school. I enjoyed being with the teachers, and I had a nice nice relationship with, with most of the teachers. And then uh, when I was a junior, we had a party. We had a Halloween party. Okay, so then uh, we had a Halloween party. Oh, no. And... Uh, our, we, we were always on the committee. Ed and I were always put on the committee for anything, act, any social doings. We always were there. And uh, we were on the committee to have this Halloween party, so we had it. And we, we were dancing. And I can remember very well that Ed asked me if we couldn't go steady. And I was delighted. Oh, geez. So the first time I brought him home, I thought my mother would faint. She couldn't believe her eyes. She said, here was this boy. I was bringing him home, and I, I wouldn't walk across the street, or I would walk around the block, so I wouldn't have to see him. Well, anyway, uh, from then on, we were always together. And that particular night, we left the party and went to a little tea room up at the end of the street. And we were horsing around, and he poured a glass of ice water down my back. And I immediately had a chill. I'll never know if that was what caused me to develop scarlet fever or not. But before, let's see, that was Halloween. And by Thanksgiving, I was quarantined with scarlet fever. During which time, the doctor didn't think I'd make it. He told my mother I couldn't live. But I guess I decided I was going to, and I did. And uh, in the meantime, it was time for a, another party at school. Well, of course, I wasn't there. And school was closed for the Christmas holidays. And Ed got together with some of the boys, and they decided that they would have a New Year's party. But they would, it was going to be for the class, but they would only pick out who they wanted to have come, which they did. And they got around the Board of Education somehow, I don't know, they went to one and said that he said it would be all right if the other one agreed, one of those who struck John deals, right? So they, uh, they had their party, and some of the boys, I don't know who, I have a slight suspicion who brought the stuff to drink, but uh -oh. they had stuff to drink, and they got drunk. And the lady in the back lived alongside of the school. She ratted on us. Plus so, this was in prohibition. Oh yeah. So this was also um, happening while I'm quarantined. <laughs> so I, I missed that. They all got uh, called down to the office. Uh, I think they were expelled for two or three days. And where I lived, um, the kids that came from Williamstown and Mullica Hill came in on the train and they had to walk from the station past my house to get to school. And I always used to know if I was running late, if the Mullica Hill kids came, they, theirs was an early train. But if I was still home when the Williamstown kids got there, I knew that I was going to be late if I didn't hurry. 
So they would go by, and after they released me from quarantine, I couldn't go right back to school. And I sat at the front window, and they would all stop and chit chat with me as they went by, you know. And they, this one girl stopped, and she said, "You can be glad you're not in school now, because she said they got us all on the pad for this party." So I, I missed that one. On, but, the, on the pad. Yeah. So this was. Uh, um, quite a, a topic of conversation for years, and it still was. We still talked about it when we got together with the, the <laughs> committee, because some of those girls were invited and some weren't. In fact, Charlotte had one of the invitations, and Ed didn't even remember that he had written an invitation. Oh, she, he almost flipped that night when uh, she said, well, wait till I show you this, and she had a postal card, and it was this invitation to this party and he didn't even remember they had sent invitations but it was his writing so then um, oh I forgot to say back too when we lived on the farm I, I meant to tell you this too about the the snow and everything um, my father the snow would be up maybe like up to the horse's belly and of course we couldn't walk and my father had a car but he couldn't drive the car and he would get this big wagon out, and he had a big a team of horses, and they called them big grays. And they would pull that wagon through the snow drifts, and we would not go down the road, we would go through the fields. And we thought that was great. We prayed for snow, cause so we could go to school that way. <laughs> and half the time, we'd get to school, and the other kids couldn't get there, and we'd have to come right, turn around and come right back. I forgot to tell you that in the... We were talking about the farm, and then we had. Um, let's see, where was I? It was uh, junior. I was a junior in high school. Then I, I finally got back in school. I was out from uh, Thanksgiving till about the middle of January. I went back in time for final exams, which I passed, much to my amazement and everybody <laughs> else's. Even history. Even history, and then. Um, in the meantime, I worked. I worked um, in a clothing store uh, for a man named Kotler, who had a lot of influence on our lives. In, the, in that he had this store after uh, after I was married, and and Jane got uh, Ed used to go there and buy her little things and bring them home to her on on payday little sweaters or a hat or something. And so Saul Cotler became almost a family member. And then uh, we had, uh, let's see. Oh, I worked for him. Worked uh, weekends, Sunday, like Friday night and Sunday, or Saturday. And then um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then I took a job, uh, I think it was my junior year, yes it was, I took a job in Pittman with the American stores again, and I was the candy kid, and they How had, were they? Uh, a 15, this was before working papers or, you know, you could work, um, yeah, and I, I worked behind the cake counter and the candies, and uh, when the fellows would fill an order, if they had an order for cakes or candies, they would call it over, and I'd fill the order and take it over to them. And then the cashier in those days sat in a little booth and took the, the money. It was, you know, and uh, she had off from 2 o'clock till 4 on Saturday afternoon, and I used to fill in her spot as cashier. And I worked for them. And then I had, uh, they wanted me to work for her while she was on vacation. Well, in those days, they balanced your register out on Monday. And if you were short, they took it out of your pay before you got it. If you were over, they kept it. I was petrified. I thought, well, I worked, but I'm not going to get a bit of pay. And I was delighted. I was delighted when... The week was over, and I had balanced out. Everything was fine. So then uh, came my senior year in high school. We had a lot of uh, good times, too many to talk about, really. 
and uh, a lot of parties, a lot, a lot of fun, and then came graduation, which was a sad time for me because I didn't want to leave school. Then I took a job in a, an office in a canning factory. A canning factory. Uh, this canning factory can for everybody. It always kind of makes me laugh when people buy labeled food because it can be canned by anybody. And we, for instance, we do like we'd have an order of, of beets, so they can the beets, and then in the mail would come labels from Del Monte. Uh, then camps back in those days was a popular. Uh, still in. Are they still in? And uh, every. We do, do it for everybody. And then the man's name was Farley. And then he had his own brand. It was all the same beats, just different labels. Sure. So I went I went there the first first day I went there and he said he hired me by the hour. And he had had an accountant do his books and they were all screwed up. So he said to me, uh, see what you can do with those books. So I took the books and by five o'clock I had them all straightened out. And he, he couldn't believe it. He said, well, he said, you're on salary. No more hour. And he said, you're hired to work as long as you want. Well, I had already signed up to go to normal school. So anyway, in the meantime, Ed was working for the government. And he had bought this car that looked like a bathtub. It was a... a the, the whippet? Oh, no, this this was... No, we didn't have the whip until we were married. This, this really looked like a bathtub. You've seen it in the old Max Senate comedy. The old open touring yeah, car type. Yeah, you yeah. open the door, the water would come out. Right, okay, <laughs> well, that's what he had. And he and the fellows used to go by. They used to pass me. I'd be walking to work, and they would go to Bridgeton, and this uh, canning factory was on out, just outside of Glassboro. Well, it wasn't outside of Glassboro, but it was down in that neighborhood. Outside for what Glassboro was then? It was over on the ridge, really. And uh, and my brother, he worked in the in the factory part, and uh, but he didn't work there too long. He he was not um, he didn't hold his job too good. Then in those days, he was too full of it. Anyway, um, I should I should have stayed because I liked that. Instead of wasting my time in school in normal school, I should have stayed with the with the business world because that that was what I liked. And. Uh, so then I, I worked a while after I went back to normal school. I, I worked a while for, for Mr. Farley, but it was um, it was too much because in those days they crammed four years into two. And you really, you got right down to business the first day. And it's funny because this woman who took me to um, Wildwood this year, uh, she worked for this same Mr. Farley. So she must have come along there after I left sometime, you know, she worked. And she liked it there too. It was a small office, yeah. but it was uh, um, a friendly office, and, and you kind of, you worked. It was a lot of work because he was very demanding and a frightening kind of a man. I mean, he, he had a voice that he carried for a mile, but I liked him. We got along well. Anyway, um, and it is a small world because one of the boys, one of his sons, his wife goes to Wildwood with us, and I didn't know it. I knew her name was Farley, but so is Sarah's name Farley. Yeah. But the, I didn't know that this girl had any connection with the Farley that I worked for. Okay. So I just found that out. Anyway, uh, then I went to college until January, and we got married. And then the fun began. We had uh, we lived with Harson Edna for a while. Ed was working in Riverton for the government. And he would come back and forth. Sometimes he would come down oh, a couple times a week, but he was always there on weekends. And Harson and Edna were very good to us. And then we, he got cancer. He was working in Riverton. Pop was always close to Harson. Yes, they were, they were close. Uh, Despite the age difference. Yes, the oldest and the youngest. And it is strange because that's the way it is with Patty and Jimmy, the oldest and the youngest. And uh, he, he would come down anyway. And then he got transferred back to Glassboro. So we came back to Glassboro and we lived with 
his mother and father. And of course, I didn't get along with his mother. I, she was very hard to live with. And he came home one day, and I just said I wouldn't come out of the bedroom as long as we lived there. I wasn't going to come out anymore. I'd go stay there. <laughs> and they went away. And his mother and father went away for the weekend. Well, by the time they came back, we had rented an apartment. And that was in August, and we moved in, and in September, the mother was born in that apartment. And we stayed there until, uh, let's see, she was born in September. That's the apartment that was across the fountain. It's the Reeves building which is not there any longer, they destroyed it. I'm trying to think. I had some frightening experiences there with her because I was just a child myself and, and she had a convulsion one day there and uh, frightened the life out of me. And uh, I'm trying to think, I think we moved in January. It was so cold. We lived on the third floor and it was steam heat. By the time the heat got up to us, it wasn't steam any longer, you know? And the landlord could have cared less. And uh, that's right, she was just a baby. We moved uh, in January in uh, on College Avenue. And uh, we lived there until the following September, I think. Um, and all this time, Ed was working for the Japanese Beetle Project. And I, I, let's see, we, I didn't know just how long we lived there because she was just uh, just starting to walk. So it must have been like the next, like September. And they, the woman that owned the house lost it and they put the house up for sheriff sale. And I was afraid that we would get put out. And the winter was coming on, so I looked for another place. And then we moved out on Chestnut Ridge into a little house that was brand new. And it was the wrong thing to do that we ever moved out of it. We should have stayed there. We could have bought it for three thousand dollars. It was brand new. It had uh, hot air heat. It had uh, three three bedrooms. It had a nice little kitchen with a breakfast nook, which in those days was very popular. Everybody had a breakfast nook. It was a, that was getting very trendy. It was a status symbol, you know, and. Uh, and it had nice living room, dining room, and it was brick. It was made of brick. So we stayed there for a while. I can't remember exactly. We moved in back in town again. It was while we lived in this brick bungalow that I learned to drive a car. Prior to this, we had bought a a whip it was this was before we moved the apartment. We bought the whip it was then uh, we had that and Ed decided that oh we went over to visit my uncle and aunt one night in Sweetsboro and there was a guy over there that had the Willie's um, agency and he and Uncle Harry, Ed and Uncle Harry went out when they came back Ed had another car. <laughs> he had bought another car um, a sedan, a two-door sedan. Just to, to back up for a second, did, did whip it if I'm not mistaken? That's the one that threw the milk bottle through the window or by accident. I don't remember that. He was still with the government though, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, and the story he had told me was that he was sitting in the car, eating his lunch, and had one of these smaller glass bottles of milk, drank the milk on the passenger side, the window was so clean, he thought it was wound down. That was one of the government cars. Well, a government yeah, car. Okay. Government threw car. it right out the window. Yeah, yeah. Through the yeah. window. <laughs> he also came home one day with his mouth all cut up. He had been in an accident. He had come over the a rise in the road, and a couple of girls in the car had been coming the other way. I don't know whose fault it was. 
but he had the accident and he had his pipe in his mouth and oh. broke, broke, broke the pipe off and drove it through the roof of his mouth. Oh. So he scared the life out of me that day coming in. He had stuff all painted all over him, you know. And uh, anyway, I learned to drive the car. And, I, and oh, that's when I learned on the new car. We had just had it, gotten it. So I took my license test. I went up for my driver's license. I passed the driver's test. Great. No problem. Went in to take the reading, the written test, flunked it. Ed told me, he said, don't worry about it. Don't study that book. He said, they don't ask you any of those <laughs> questions. Oh. <laughs> so the next, I and went He obviously to, never phoned so, up on it after that. Right. The next, I studied the book and went back the next week. And the guy who had given me the driver's test outdoors was inside. They, they switched. He was inside giving the written test. And when I went in, he said to me, what are you doing here? You passed last week. I said, not the drug, not the written test. I didn't. So I took it, got a hundred. I no problem. I studied the book, right? So uh, they had that, what three laws in those days. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was worth a round or two, you know, of argument. <laughs> and then uh, we stayed out there. We had uh, we had nice neighbors there, Italian uh, couple, and they they were very fond of us, and we were fond of them very fond of Jane, and they had two little kids, and uh, as I said before, your hindsight is always better than, your, than what you can see right now, and uh, we should have bought that house and stayed there. The man wanted to sell it, it had never been lived in, it was brand new, and for $3,000. Now, by the same token, we could have bought that piece of land in Glassboro where where the P&B diner is, yeah. that goes this way. Mm -hmm. We could have bought that, and where the um, bowling glass bowl is. Yeah. We could have bought that piece of land for three thousand dollars. Good God. And the first piece of it sold for thirty-three thousand. But you know, in those days, we had no collateral. That's right. We had no money saved. We just were living on what we had to, you know, what we made. And sometimes it was not too much. Never had too much money. No days. You never had anything that really that you could, without robbing Peter to pay Paul, you, it, was, it was touch and go. And now you're headed towards the front end of the Depression. Yes, yes. Well, we were into the Depression, really. It was 1928. That's right. We were in it. And uh, I, made, I made clothes and... Uh, Jane has often said she remembers that I used to take her and drop her off at Sunday school and that I wouldn't go to Sunday school because I didn't have a dress to wear. I didn't have a dress good enough to wear to Sunday school. I used to make my own dresses out of, um, uh, they would be just ordinary house dresses, nothing fancy, you know, I didn't have a fancy dress. And uh, I used to, I forgot to say too when I was talking about my nephew living with us. I used to take him to school with me because my mother had so much to do. My sister was home after she'd been in the sanitarium. She came home. And uh, she was there and she needed round the clock care, really. And uh, so the baby, he wouldn't let anybody do anything for him but me. And he was two years old. And they allowed me to bring him to school with me. And I'll take him. Like, I wouldn't take him for old day. I'd go home and get him at lunchtime and take him. And he'd sit in the seat with me and, and pull with a piece of paper. Or sometimes he'd take a nap. And the teachers accepted him. No no problem. Like, you couldn't do that now. No. Be, they wouldn't <laughs> think of it, you know. Their insurance wouldn't cover it. No, no. And uh, I have often said, and I, I still think, that we came up in the best of times. Um, that's hard for maybe for you to understand because you don't know anything else but what you've been, been brought up in. But now I've, I had part of that and part of this. And I, I can see where I think we had the best of times because the things that we did were, what I want to say, they weren't provided for us. We made our amusements, you know. As Dickens wrote, they were the best of times. They, they were, were the worst. worst of times. So true. And uh, it, I guess it's all in, in how how and what you did during those times, how you felt. Because uh, some people um, 
would rather not have lived then, would rather have lived at another time. But we saw all the things come into being. We saw, uh, we saw television. We saw radio. We saw, uh, I can remember not having a bathroom, as I said before. I can remember not having electric lights. I can remember not having heaters. I can remember the big spill when we had our first heater. And that was when we first came back to Glassboro. And the first time we moved from Malika Hill to Glassboro. We did have electric lights in, in the house, the second house in Malika Hill that we moved in. But um, we, we have seen all those things come into being. And all the, all the different kinds of, of clothing material. Uh, it was only cotton when I was growing up. Cotton and wool. Cotton and wool, yes. And um, I guess if you really had the big box of spending, you get linen. Yes, because my mother had linen dish towels. I can remember that. She would save and buy linen by the yard and make her own dish towels, but she would have nothing else but linen. And they were beautiful and they washed up, you know, yes. just gorgeous. They were and lovely to dry dishes on. First time she came to my house and I had a terry carpet. <laughs> she said, well, this belongs in the bathroom. I said, well, no, it don't. That's what we dry dishes with. And then, so as I look back and I think of, of all the, the good times we had and the bad times, we had a lot of bad times. It was all worth it. And then and we went on, and from there we moved, let's see, we were out on the ridge, and we moved back in town. And then I, I don't know, that house was small, and I just didn't particularly like it, although it was nice, your mother was little, and it was all fenced in, the yard was all fenced in, and that, that was real nice. But uh, I'd get the bug every once in a while, and I'd go house hunting. <laughs> and uh, I went out back on the ridge, on the same road where we lived in the brick bungalow, and I saw another place that I liked pretty well, and it was bigger. So we moved back out on the ridge, and we didn't move because we didn't pay the rent. We paid rent, but we just, it just was one of those things, and uh, that, was, that was a nice place. That had uh, two nice big bedrooms, and it had a bathroom, living room, dining room, kitchen, it had a finished basement. Uh, had a uh, big porch, had a garage. Well, we lived there, and then uh, Ed had to go down south for the summer. Well, he left, and Jane and I were alone all, all that summer. And that was the year she was going to start school. So, she started school. And I, we only had one car, so I had to take him in to work in the morning. Then I'd come back and I'd get her. I'd take her into school. I drove, I think we figured up, like 12 miles a day just delivering him and, and Jane. You said you worked in our south? Yeah, he worked with the Beetle down south. Whereabouts down south? He was in uh, Virginia. He was in West Virginia. Uh, so where would you be driving him? The train? No, this was when he came back then. Oh, okay. I would be driving him from the ridge into town. And, oh, that summer I had the car. Now this Whippet, this was funny. Uh, this Whippet had a steering wheel control. Had a button in the middle of the steering wheel. You pulled up on it to start it. You pushed down on it to blow the horn. You turned it one, I don't know, one way or the other for your life. But everything was controlled. <laughs> okay. So I started out this morning in the car. Well, if you pulled up on this to start it, it had a, uh, well, it wasn't called a mainspring. It, that thing had a name. It was a spring of some kind. Well, if you pulled up on it just in a certain way, it would snap. Okay, so that's this one. This all happened in one day. I pulled up the truck. Okay, so I had to call the garage. They came and got the car. In the meantime, they dropped me off at my father's store. I don't know what I could have been doing 
that I had to have a car that day. So, my father said, take our car, which was a Ford. I took that, and his car had the same kind of a thing on it. It was on the starter on the Ford. I broke that. So now I got two cars in the garage, right? And he said, take the truck. He had a delivery truck. And do you know I broke the spring in that delivery truck three in a day? And the, the fellow in the garage said, I think you've had it. I said, I think I have too. Well, by that time, my car's fixed. You know? Time to buy a horse. Yeah. <laughs> I was furious all in one day. Ed, Ed could never understand that. Don't know how you did it. So then every time it would happen and he was driving, I'd say, don't know how you did it. But he never did three in one day. But that was a record. <laughs> It must have just been somebody sitting on my shoulder. Then, um, let's see, then where were we? We were out on the ridge. And so we decided we'd better move back in town. So we moved back in town and uh, lived on West Street. And that was a double house. And Jane had, uh, we had Fluffy, little German Spitz dog. And when we're moving from the ridge into Glassboro, I was I had the car full of stuff and was bringing it in. And she's on the back seat with the dog. And all of a sudden, she hollered, oh, that hurt. And I said, what happened? And she said, Fluffy, scratch me. So I said, well, take her away from your face. Don't let her scratch it. So we went on and we moved in. And the kids from the neighborhood were in. And they were playing school, the little girls. And my mother was there to help me in. She said, I'll take Jane up and give her a bath so she'll be ready for school in the morning and you won't have to stop. And she wasn't upstairs very long. She came back down. She said, I can't give her a bath. She's covered with chicken pot. So I thought, what a way to go into a new neighborhood. You've got the neighbor's kids all in playing with your kids. She's got chicken pot, right? Mm-hmm. Well, as it happened, nobody got them. But she had the chicken pot. So then we stayed there in that house. And uh, for quite a while, four years, I guess. And Ed, oh, in the meantime, Ed lost his job with the government. I never asked any questions. I never knew why. Hmm. And uh, and there was no notice. It was like he came home tonight. This is it. He lost his job. Well, this would have been about 1932, still, right? Um, yes. Getting this in the fifth grade. But you were that far along. Uh-huh. This is up in the mid 30s now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh, then he took a job selling cars, selling Ford. Yeah. And we decided that we couldn't stand the expenses where we were and in next door to his mother and father they had people in there that they wanted to get out so they decided that they would give us cheap rent if we would move there and take care of the place that's what we did and that's where we stayed for 28 years in the big house and we, we paid cheap rent and but we did our own repairs and took care of it and it was from that house that your mother got married you boys were born. I guess that held a lot more trauma than any house we ever lived in. There were more things happened there. My father died while we lived there. Uh, my brother and all died while we lived there. There were a lot of things, unhappy things happened. There were also a lot of happy things. Your brother in law being Paul Harvey Sr. Paul Harvey Sr., my sister's husband. And. Uh, I went to work from there. Uh, first of all, I worked for uh, Abbott's Drug Store during the war because the fellow who had the job went, was called up <coughs> for me. And then he came back and he wanted the job. By this time, Jane is a senior in high school. He came back and he wanted the job, so I left. And after I left, he, didn't, he quit too. He didn't want the job after all. But I didn't go back because in the meantime, they had asked me to come to work as a checker in back in the markets. So, so uh, that's when I started to work, and I worked for 14 years with the company.
There were a lot of good times, a lot of bad times mixed up in that, too. And then, in the meantime, after we had moved, Ed got the job on the bridge, which was our salvation. It was not until then that we ever really saw daylight. Got our noses above water, so to speak. You know, it was, it was, uh, we did finally have five hours to call our own, but we could, if we wanted to spend it foolishly, we could. And uh, that job also had its disadvantages. He had to work so quick. Uh, we had to work weekends, but we, we managed and we started our climb upward to where we got to up for this year for me. And with both of us working, then we got out of debt and have found it so far to stay out. But um, there's been a lot of strange things happen, and I don't know. Uh, can you think of anything that's happened that you want me to talk about that, that I didn't touch on? Or? Well, uh, a couple of things that you might want to okay. throw out. One person is like the uh, same thing as story that I is, is in my direct line, but uh, that I never met was your father. Yeah, well, true. My father died in 1945, so that was. He, he died before your mother. He died the year your mother graduated from high school. Uh, he was quite a guy. I, I, the only way I can describe him is that he just, uh, he was laid back. He, he, didn't, uh, he didn't push for things. Uh, he was happy with his pipe and his old pants and his shirt. And a sweater if he was cold. He didn't care about clothes. Uh, he was a gentleman. He was not uh, allowed. He was very quiet. In fact, it does seem he was around. He was round. He was he was fat, and uh, that was his downfall. Because he, he could not. Uh, the doctor would put him, uh, take him off of liquids, and the man would. Just he would lose weight while you're looking at it, but as soon as that was, that period was over, he was right back drinking his juices. He liked water. He, he my mother was uh, one to make um, molasses cakes, molasses cookies, mm -hmm. and I've seen my father take maybe four molasses cookies and a glass of ice water, and thoroughly enjoy it as much as you would beer and pretzels or wine and cheese or whatever. Cold ice water and ginger cakes, molasses cakes. Um, he liked food. He liked good food. He liked meat. He had meat every morning for breakfast. He either would be a chop or it would be steak. It would be ham. I never knew what it was to see a steak less than an inch thick <laughs> and bright red. The butcher's daughter. Yep. And I like my, still like my meat that way. But he, he was... Uh, as I say, he was a gentleman, and he was, uh, uh, he and my mother were matched well because my mother was fiery, and uh, she had a temper. My father never held a grudge. Uh, if, he, uh, if he did something that he didn't like, he'd tell you. So he'd be your friend. He, he was not uh, a vengeful man at all. And that's, that's one of the reasons that he couldn't get along with his brother on the farm. My Uncle Morris was a, a hard, hard man, just the opposite of my father. Now, you, you did know your great-grandmother, so yeah. you knew that she was feisty. And oh, she, she, was, she lived to the extreme. <laughs> she's, she's the one that told you, want me to tell the tale about the, the uh, ghost. She told me this because this was long before I was born. I think it happened in Merchantville. They lived in this house. And she said every afternoon at 4 o'clock, she heard somebody shake a rug from her upstairs window. And she said she would go look, and there wasn't anybody there. She'd come back in, and she could hear the rug being shaken. <laughs> then uh, in this same house, she had a broom at the top of the cellar steps that she swept the steps with. She'd sweep the steps every day, She'd put the broom at the top of the stairs, and in the morning, the broom would be down at the bottom, not laid not on the floor, 
standing up. She said she never could understand it, but she knew somebody, and it wasn't she nor my father. That's all there was in the house. And my father wouldn't have taken a broom downstairs. He had fallen over first before he took it down. <laughs> so she, that's the story she told, and uh, I have to believe it because she wouldn't have made it up. 